Luke 19, verse 25. I'm sorry, 29. Luke 19, 29. says here, And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, wherein yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. What would that be? That would be a wild ass's colt. This thing's wild. Nobody ever sat on it before. Verse 31. And if any man ask you, why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they sat, set Jesus thereon. Okay? Notice it doesn't say anything in the next couple of verses there. We're not going to read them, but it doesn't say anything about Jesus, you know, looking like these cowboys in the pictures, you know, with the go, whoa, whoa, you know. Why? Because he's the creator. He is God. So that wild ass is colt. He can break it and get in that saddle and there's no fight. Very interesting. Okay? And you say, but uh, why would Jesus do this with a wild ass's colt? I mean, why not just go and get a, a, a good old horse that's been tried and true or whatever? Why a wild one like that? Well, because he's picturing a sinner. And why does he break a sinner? Because there it says, because the Lord hath need of him. You know, there's a very easy test that you can do to see if God needs you. Just go like this. Take your right hand, hold it up. Now put it in front of your mouth and breathe in and out three times. If you can feel breath on your hand, then God needs you. Okay. Oh, why would God let me live right now? Those things are so bad and everything. God needs you. There are sinners out there that need to be witnessed to. God needs you to stand for the truth. God needs you to witness to the lost. God needs you to stand against the evil. God needs you to put out tracts. God needs you to... God needs you. The Lord hath need of you. If you are living on this earth, God has need of you. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you've done. If you're saved, God needs you. Keep that in mind. Okay? And I can tell you, a lot of us, you know, at one point in time, were pretty wild before we got saved. I know many of you have contacted me, told me your testimony and things. There's some wild Christians out there that were broken by Jesus Christ. The Lord got on them and said, Okay, you're mine now. You belong to me. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, too, there. Now, I, I, I don't, I'm going to get ahead of myself. We'll go back to verse 18 in Philemon. I'm not following my notes here. I'm getting... I'm going too fast. <laughs> but uh, we're going to see the perfect uh, definition of imputation in the Bible. Right, imputed righteousness. Philemon's verse, Philemon verse 18. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Okay, that's a perfect picture of what Jesus Christ did for us in terms of to God the Father. Okay, here's how it works. Number one, we wronged God by sinning with the bodies that he gave to us. Okay, number two, we owe God a debt that we can't possibly pay. Number three, Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross and paid the penalty for those sins. We have wronged God. We can't pay him. So Jesus says, put that on my account. See, that's what imputation is. Okay, keep your hand there and go to Romans chapter 4. Romans 4. Verses 6 through 8. These are the verses about imputed righteousness. 
Romans 4, verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. All right. What you did in your life as a sinner, as a lost sinner, what you've done, what you're going to do, is put onto the perfect record of Jesus Christ, and that perfect record of Jesus Christ is put onto you. That's how imputation works. All right? It's a blessed, wonderful thing. Definitely. And it's kind of interesting. You know, going back to this analogy of the wild asses colt. Here's the process of salvation, how that thing works. Number one, we are all sinners, wild and self-righteous, and we think we know it all. Number two, the Lord breaks us through repentance. Number three, we become His property and He gives us His good name. That's why you're called a Christian, right? You are now part of the family of God. Are you kind of like you're the wild ass's colt and now you're you're out there roaming around the mountains and running around through the rain and the all the bad winter and the the, the weather and the snow and everything else, don't have much to eat and whatever. And the Lord says, you, I have need of you, come here. And he gets that wild ass's colt and he says, don't fight me, gets on, the horse submits to his will, and now that horse is part of that ranch. But interesting, what do you do when you have a horse and you make him part of your ranch? You take that branding iron. What's that? You're sealing him saying, this is one of our horses. In Ephesians 1.13, if you want to go there, Ephesians 1.13 says here, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the Lord puts his seal upon you, like that. You're now sealed. You're part of his family. Okay? And as the property of Jesus Christ, we are no longer free to do what we want. And we can no longer, excuse me, run wild in this world. You see, once that wild ass is colt out there in the mountains that's been running around, once he's brought down into the ranch and he's now broken and he's now a part of the ranch and he now has that seal on him that wild ass's colt is no longer allowed to go out there into the world out there into the wilds and things like that and roam, roam around now he has a job to do depending on the size of the horse and whatever else he might pull a little carriage around he might be the faithful horse for a cowboy going out and rounding up other horses he might you know, pull heavy equipment, whatever, right? There are different purposes for those horses, but the fact of the matter is, once that horse becomes part of the ranch, it's now bought with a price, it's now sealed, and it doesn't leave. It's important to get that thing. And I'll say this, too. There are two types of horses, all right? You have the one horse that gladly serves and obeys their master. And they're rewarded for it. Okay, A horse like that is, is one that is loved by the master. And the master does good things and gives them good food and keeps them warm and keeps them clean and gives them a nice place to live and whatever else. And, you know, I don't, I don't talk a whole lot about it. But the fact is, you know, God can bless you with a good life down here on this earth. You don't have to be kicked around and whipped and beaten and things the whole way through your life. You know, I mean, yeah, if you serve the Lord, you are going to you know, suffer persecution and things like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying God can bless you in this life. God can do great things for you if you're submitting yourself to Him. All right? The other type of horse is one that balks and resists their master. I'll tell you a little bit of story here, a little story from my way back past. In fact, not even my past. It's my grandfather's past. Uh, my grandfather was raised in the early 1900s. He died in uh, 1992, and um, 
uh, definitely a saved man, a very, very neat man, and I miss him very much, and uh, I know I'm going to see him again, so that makes it a lot easier. But the fact of the matter is he was he told me this story about when he was a boy. And back when he was young, they had they did most everything with horses back then. Uh, when he was a little boy, there weren't that many cars around, so everybody was still using horse drawn whatever. And they had a dairy farm. And they would milk the cows and they would put the milk in these big stainless steel milk jugs. And then they would put those milk jugs onto a big wagon. And then they had a horse. And that horse would pull this wagon to the, you know, railroad depot or wherever else. And they would load the milk on and it would go and take it into the city. Well, this one winter, uh, they got their horse. And this horse, you know, they put everything. They hooked him up to the wagon and they put all the milk on the wagon and everything else. And they all got up on the wagon. Uh, my grandfather and his brother, my grandfather was actually an identical twin. His name was Milton and his brother name was Vic. They both died now, but, you know, Milton and Vic, Denlinger. And I don't remember what my great-grandfather's name would have been, but um, they were taking their milk to market. And uh, they were going along and this horse was doing okay and all of a sudden this horse did something called balking where the horse just just stops dead in its tracks and you can whip that horse and you can beat that horse and they were you know great grandfather he was just whipping it and whipping it and whipping it didn't matter you could talk to it nicely you could do whatever and that thing was just stubborn just stood there like that so they got down off of the wagon and you know my great-grandfather was going over and he was yanking on the horse and hitting it and trying to get it to move. Would not move. So he told my grandfather and his brother, he said, you boys go and get some sticks. I have an idea. So they ran over and there was a wooden, wooded area there and they went over and they got these sticks, brought them back, and he said, okay, let's pile these up underneath this horse. We'll get him to move. So they piled up a nice big pile of sticks underneath their horse and uh, lit the sticks on fire. Well, the horse just stayed there like that until his belly was starting to get a little bit warm. And so thinking, you know, this will loosen him up and now he'll be fine and he'll move again. No, the horse, all he did was he took about four or five steps forward. Now the fire's no longer his belly, but now it's under the wagon. So guess what happened? The wagon is soon on fire and now you got a flaming wagon. Well, now the horse realizes I'm tied to a flaming wagon. So he decides he's going to take off running. So this horse is no longer balked. Now there's a fire behind him and he's running full tilt and there's milk flying off everywhere and the jug's falling over and spilling milk and uh, quite a disaster. My grandfather would tell me this story, you know, and things. And I remember being a boy, and I always wanted to hear that story. It was it was such a neat story. And, of course, he did a lot better than I could. You know, he was a much better storyteller. But, you know, interestingly, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. A Christian is likened to a, you know, a, a sinner, I should say, is likened to a wild ass's colt. And there's many similarities between us and horses as far as you know how God views us as sinners and things and how we can be stubborn but a Christian that messes up a lot of times will make problems with the word with the word of God they'll spill the word of God so to speak they won't handle it rightly anymore kind of an interesting little story there I just was thinking about that recently here but um, go back to Philemon Philemon, verse 19. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Okay. <clears throat> Paul was willing to pay for Onesimus' faults. All right. But interestingly, again, Philemon was really the one that was in debt to Paul. But Paul was saying, hey, again, I'm not going to use that power over you, but... 
you know, if you'll let Onesimus come back, I'll pay whatever he owes. All right. Interesting. Verse 20. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Ref refresh my bowels in the Lord. And again, you know, we should bring joy to our brethren, you know, by the lives that we live. That's something that, that we should do. You know, we should try to exhort one another in the Lord. That's always very important. Verse 21. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Can that be said of you? If the Lord has a job for you, are you willing to go, you know, as they say, above and beyond the call of duty? Again, it's another challenge. It's something else that the Lord says, you know, puts it in your mind, uh, you know, you're someplace and it's just like you look and there's a really good spot to put a tract or there's somebody there and you think, I ought to give that person a tract. And you go over, you lay the tract down or you give the tract to the person or, or whatever. I mean, you say you witness to for some reason or you, you know, whatever, you know, do you go to the next step? And say, I put a track down there, so I filled my quota for the day. Or do you say, no, I put a track down there. Hey, I can put one over here, too. Are you like Philemon there, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say? Hmm. Another little challenge there. This book is actually a very challenging book for us as Christians. And uh, I'll tell you right now, if you go above and beyond the call of duty with the Lord... The Lord will give you those difficult assignments. He'll give you the very special assignments. He'll open up doors of utterance for you. And He'll use you greatly. If you're willing to go above and beyond the call of duty with the Lord. Verse 22 through 23, let's read these. It says, But withal prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Again, you know, it's kind of funny. It's so different from modern-day Christianity, you know. I mean, he's in prison writing and saying, you know, I, I hope, hopefully I can come out, you know, and be with you. But this brings up another point. When was the last time you thanked the Lord for your freedom? You said, well, bless God, brother. I sure am glad for my constitutional rights. I didn't say constitutional rights. I said freedom. Your freedom comes from the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, if the government goons out there decide to come after you and get you, they don't care about your constitutional rights. They could care less. And there have been many examples in the past where they violated people's constitutional rights and killed them. You say, give me a good example. Okay, David Koresh. You say, oh, come on, Brian. David Koresh was nuts. Oh, yeah, he was nuts. He was absolutely nuts. The guy was crazy. He thought he was Jesus Christ. Okay, or the lamb, I guess I should say. He thought he was the lamb in Revelation chapter 4. You know, he was nuts. 4 and 5, I should say. You know, he thought it was his responsibility to open up the seals. The guy was crazy. But the point is, the crimes that he did, uh, letting the, the license um, for the conversion of fully automatic or semi-automatic rifles to fully automatic, which was legal, he just had to have a license for that, and he let his license expire, and he didn't pay the fee on a couple rifles that they converted. There was that, and there was also he was fornicating with underage girls, which, again, problem. But the ATF went in there, guns blazing, shot him in the stomach, and killed his father-in-law. His father-in-law didn't even do anything, you know? And then they came in there, and they basically, you know, raided the, the Branch Davidian thing totally violated their constitutional rights. See, their freedom did not come from the Constitution. Their freedom would have been granted to them by God if they had been, you know, actually saved, and they weren't. They were a heretical sect of Seventh-day Adventism. But uh, my point is, your freedom, if you are free right now, it's because God has made you free. It's not because of the Constitution. It's not because of whatever laws you have or whatever else, it's because God has given you that freedom. That's something we take for granted. We just think it's our right that we should, you know, always be free and, and out of prison. 
Uh, that's not been the case for many, most of church history. Most of church history, Christians have been persecuted pretty rough. And uh, I thank God for the opportunity right now to be able to preach the Word of God to all the world without fear of going to jail. At least not yet. I hope it never comes to that, but uh, I'm going to preach as hard as I can. You know, I'm going to offend people. That's just the way it is. But uh, let's look at verse 24. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. All right, we're going to look at some interesting things here. You can keep your hand there in uh, Philemon, but go back to Acts chapter 15. We're going to see about two of these guys. I'm not going to look up everything about them, but about these four guys here that are mentioned, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas. Okay, we're going to look up just something about two of these guys. Acts chapter 15, verse 36 it says here, And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. There you have Marcus. Look at what Paul says here, verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And then Paul chooses Silas and departs another way. Okay, a couple points here. Number one, can two brethren have such a sharp disagreement that they part company? Yeah. Can you do that and still love your brother? Yeah, you can. Uh, we don't all have to get along. Okay. There are some times that the Lord might want you to go do something else with your life and let your other brother there just, hey, you do your work, I'll do mine. You know, depart, part company, get the work done. Still have to love them if they're your brother, but there are times that you can part company. But uh, notice there that uh, verse 38 there, Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Basically, Marcus for whatever reason, he was going to do the work of the Lord and he didn't do it. He parted and said, no, nah, I can't, I, he came up with an excuse. And Paul's like, I don't trust this guy, this Marcus guy. But over here in Philemon, he's saying that he's a fellow laborer. Interesting. So, he determined that he was going to serve the Lord and something went wrong, but he went right back to it. You know, there are many times that you're going to fail in your walk with the Lord. When the Lord's going to open up to you a door of utterance and you're not going to take it. I've done that myself sometimes. The Lord gave me a great opportunity to witness to somebody and I kept my mouth shut. That was stupid. That was stupid. But you see, I came back to it. I said, Lord, I'm sorry I failed you that time, but please don't, don't kick me out of service here. Please let me continue. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try to do better. Don't be discouraged if you've had a failure in your past. Get back to work for the Lord. But let's uh, look at uh, 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. We're going to see about Demas now. And Mark as well. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Look at this. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So Mark is still going good here, still going strong. But Demas, for whatever reason, departed, having loved this present world. Again, there are some people that love the present world and they depart from the service of the Lord. 
right? At some point in time, you're going to fail the Lord, right? At some point in time, you're going to backslide or do whatever. The devil's going to get to you, and you're going to get weak, and you're going to, you're going to mess up. The solution to it is get back to the Lord. Don't just say, well, you know, forget it and go back to the world. Don't do that. And stay there in the world. All right. Be diligent about the things of the Lord. That's very important. All right. Verse 25. To conclude our study of Philemon. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So Paul begins with grace and he ends with grace. So that's the study of the book of Philemon. And I want to make one more point here. I had a brother write this to me and it's an interesting question. And that is, if the Pauline epistles typify the life of a Christian, and I have a sermon about, about that, the church age, and it talks about you know how the, the order of the Pauline epistles, the, Paul, the books that Paul wrote, actually line up with the steps of a Christian's life. And it ends with the book of Philemon. And so if that's true, and in the book of Philemon is the last book that's written to a Christian in the church age, is there a rapture somewhere in here? And I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I listened to this thing, and you know, I have an MP3 player, and I Alexander Scorby recordings, and I must have listened to this book of Philemon 30 or more times. I mean, I just listen to it and listen to it and listen to it. I try to do that. I try to listen to it. I try to read through it a couple times. Just really get it into my head. I pray before I put the message together. And then I end up spending you know, a good part of a day putting these notes together. And is there kind of a rapture there? Kind of a, a tip or a, a, something that typifies the rapture? Well, I'll give you a, so, sort of an interpretation of it. Um, you know, Paul pictures the mature, elderly Christian in the book of Philemon. Okay, I talked about that in my study on the church age. Okay, he's Paul the aged, right? And he's saying, I don't need to even be about my own thing anymore here. I'm just concerned about my this young man Onesimus. You know, and he's sending him back to Philemon and everything else there. And you know, you can kind of make that into somewhat of a rapture type of a thing because you have Paul, the older Christian, and he's sending Onesimus back to his master. Right? So you could say that Onesimus pictures, you know, the Gentile, you know, we are bond servants of, of the Lord and we're being sent back to the master. Going up. And Paul says, I trust also that, you know, I shall certainly be sent unto you. So even the old Christians there of the first century also being sent back to Philemon. So it's, you know, I would never teach it doctrinally, but there, you know, in type, there's a little bit there. But, you know, I just thought I'd mention that. Not real super strong to prove, you know, the pre-trib rapture. But, uh, you know, I don't need that either to pre prove the pre-trib rapture. I mean, the pre-trib rapture is very easy to prove from other scriptures. But it is interesting. It is an interesting thought that, you know, in type, Philemon kind of pictures, you know, God the Father, Onesimus, the new Christian, Paul, the older Christian, and they both are going back to Philemon. Interesting. But that's going to be it for our study of Philemon. Um, I do have some more expository studies coming up, but there's a bunch of uh, subject sermons that I'm going to be doing. A um, bunch of things on the go right now. Uh, doing a lot of research and things like that. Um, that's something I think a lot of people don't realize. You know, I see a lot of videos of uh, quote-unquote preaching you know, from people. And, and I'm not saying Bible believers. I'm saying you know, a lot of times just anybody and they just turn on the camera and just talk, you know, for a while. Uh, no study involved, no nothing. That's not what goes on here. Um, I really try to put a lot into my studies. Uh, you know, my wife helps me as well with a lot of the research on more of the detailed studies. These regular 
you know, expository preaching or whatever, you know, I do that myself. But when it comes to a lot of real heavy research, um, I thank the Lord that I have a wife that can really help me for that, or help me with that rather. So, um, I think if there's anything else I have to mention, you know, there's uh, a couple studies that I've been wanting to bring out, and I'm trying to find where I put my documentation. We're slowly getting things put away, you know, and everything else, but I'm having a hard time finding some of the documentation and all the notes that I had taken and everything else. And so, working on a lot of different studies right now. Um, please keep us in your prayers. And, uh, like I said, we're going to start doing some more subjects, and then I'll be getting into some more expository uh, studies. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for this book, this book of Philemon, because there's some really good challenges in it, Lord, that some good reminders that, that uh, we're like Onesimus. We don't have a life that's our own anymore. And we are supposed to serve you with our lives, Lord, and not get sidetracked and not get uh, messed up with the world. We are supposed to be your bond servants, Lord. And Lord, that subject is so controversial nowadays, and, and so many people are ashamed of you and of your words because your word runs so contrary to the lost world. I just pray, Lord, that no one out there that's listening to this right now would be ashamed of you and of your words but that we would boldly stand up and say, this book is God's book, and I'll stand behind it until the day of my death. I just pray, Lord, that you would give courage to each member of the body of Christ out there, and that you would teach us, Lord, to love the brethren. It's very difficult sometimes, Lord, and but I just I pray, Lord, for discernment and uh, just the wisdom that we need to make it through this life. And uh, I just, again, Lord, I ask that uh, everyone out there would, would be sober and be vigilant in these very dark and evil days. And that, that uh, you would keep all of us um, in your word and that we would not faint in these tough times. And no matter what happens to in the future, that we would continue to stand for the faith. And I just ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That is going to be it. Um, still working on a couple things here. Uh, like I said, I have some subjects that I've been wanting to bring out, but I'm just, till I find the notes and things like that, uh, you know, just having a hard time with it. Um, please be patient if you've, you know, sent sermon suggestions because I've had some really, really, really good ones and I'm really looking forward to putting some things together. Um, it's just that, you know, right now trying to get all my research down, you know, together and everything. So please keep us in your prayers. And that's going to be it. We will see you next week. Thank you for watching.